There's no such thing as an original story. I reckon everyone could tell at least three mythological stories if they really thought about it. Is that contentious? Perhaps, but uh, then again, that's the danger of giving an actor a microphone and allowing him to write his own soliloquy and giving him a stage on which to perform it. But there is something so gloriously ancient Greek in doing that. A time when politics and stories were essentially symbiotic. I mean, doesn't that just sound familiar? Has anything actually changed? I don't think it has. A good story still has the potential to influence millions of people. Only now, we call it fake news. Originality. That is where I need to start with this. Because every story is unique to the individual, based upon the meaning that they read into it. Therefore, relatability and reinvention and reinterpretation become the answer to this question in order to allow the audience or the reader or the listener to access these stories. This is my story. I wanted to be Indiana Jones. No, I did. I wanted to be Indiana Jones. It's not a joke. I, um, I don't have any problem distinguishing between the real world and the movies. I just was drawn in by this fascination of these ancient mythological fantasy stories. So I went to university. I studied archaeology and classical civilization. And it was whilst I was there, well, it was whilst I was there that I realized I actually probably just wanted to pretend to be an archaeologist. But it was whilst I was there that I also realized that I wanted to tell these stories and I wanted to tell them properly. So I went off and I studied acting and I became an actor. And now, well, now I work in business, so I don't actually use either of them. <laughs> But why is, this, why is this relatable? Because in order to captivate and to entertain a listener, you need to tell a story so that the listener can relate to it. The first problem, though, that we have with telling these classical mythological stories, mythological stories, is that you have to cut through the intellectual snobbery that is there to start with. There is so much intellectual snobbery attached to classical studies that risks alienating them. There's an article from Edith Hall. If you don't know Edith Hall, she is a renowned classicist and a commentator in the media on the ancient world. And she said that classical stories should be available to all. And I, I absolutely agree with that. They're themes of power, ambition, hunger, love, loathing, they are as relevant today as they were 2,000 plus years ago. Whether we are seeing them through reality TV presidents or whether we're seeing them through the migration movements, these are the plots of Greek mythological stories. Now I stand here and I speak from a position of relative strength when I say that in our education system, we have an awful tendency to overanalyze stories in a way that if we're not careful, we risk alienating these stories from future readerships. Because if you consider them in their original context, they don't relate to us today. But like, like with Shakespeare, what we should in fact be doing is not considering them in their original context or not dwelling on them in their original context, but rather focusing on updating them and making them relevant to the modern audience. Stephen Fry, the, the great Stephen Fry, wrote a book not long ago called Mythos, if you know it, and it's based upon the original Greek creationist myths. And in his marketing of this book, he was asked a very similar question to this in terms of why are these stories still so relevant today? And he used a very good example on the Prometheus myth on the creation of man. And he managed to find a parallel, almost a health warning, between the creation of man and the rise of robotic technology today, both in our future and almost as a warning for how it would look further down the line. As an actor, what I've discovered is that you gain more from these stories in their modern readaptations, and you get more of a genuine reaction from the audience. To keep reinventing these stories is to allow them to keep enduring. Now, a number of years ago, I, I was involved in a production of 
Greek by Stephen Burkhoff, which is a modern retelling of the Oedipus myth, set against the backdrop of 1980s Thatcherite Britain, arguably because that's the point that Burkhoff was looking to make at the time. But it was in performing this that I discovered something which has stuck with me ever since. These stories do continue to infiltrate our lives, but in order to tell a classical mythological story, you don't need to tell the original story in order to retell the original story. You do have creative license over it. We all know the Oedipus story, and we all know how it ends. He plucks out his eyes when he realizes that he's slept with his mom and killed his dad. Um, but in the Greek story, in the Burkhoff version of it, he has his Oedipus character, Eddie, get to the point of plucking out of his eyes, and he says, <laughs> no, 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 no. Why am I going to pluck out my eyes? I, I mean, I've slept with my mum, so what? So what if I want to climb back up inside her? I mean, these are Burkhoff's words. But why not? I mean, not that, but why not? <laughs> why not subvert an audience's expectation of the ending in order to keep that myth alive? The Greeks did it. They did it in their own time. They, they wrote the stories and then a year later would have reinterpreted them. Why? Because it kept them relevant and it kept them entertaining and they only had so many stories that they could actually tell. But they said, the Greeks said that an original story doesn't need to be original. It just needs to have this original angle to it. To reinvent is to survive. And that's the theme that I will always keep coming back to when considering Greek mythological stories. It's not a ground-shifting question, this, what's so ancient about Greek mythology. It's, it's, it's not even a particularly new question, but it is a relevant question. The answer? Nothing, arguably. Nothing. These stories, they're not relatable. If you take them in their original time, they are not relatable stories. They were written in a different time for a different purpose for a different audience. So therefore, reinvention becomes absolutely critical. There's a great book by a French writer, um, Robert Queno, called The uh, Exercises in Style, in which he takes a very simple story based upon a man on a bus, and then later on in the day, in a marketplace, where his friend is telling him that he needs to replace a button on his jacket. That's it. That is the story. But he takes that story and he explores it in 99 different ways, changing intonation, tone, pitch, dialect, experimentation with accents, and every time he does it, the story changes. And to me, that exemplifies Greek mythology. It's the, it's the Chinese whisper nature of it, this need to take a story and reinterpret it so that it is modern for the present day. We've been telling mythological stories for as long as people have actually been prepared to listen to them. Because myths, they characterize, they explain, they define our humanity, but only arguably in the way that the myth teller wants us to understand them. There is no one way to do it. But again, arguably, is that not just fake news in the modern day? Realize it or not, Greek myths continue to infiltrate our 21st century society. Shakespeare knew it in his own time. Shakespeare was heavily influenced by Greek mythology. Midsummer Night's Dream, Romeo and Juliet, they are based upon Greek mytholo myth mythological stories. It's a long word to say. In the 21st century, we could sell these stories principally on their themes of sex, power, violence, body image, grit, adventure. In fact, probably the best example of it is what is currently dominating the cinematic landscape, the Marvel and the DC comic book universes. They're great, they're wonderful stories, but they're not new. They are based upon mythology, and the superheroes are based upon Greek mythological heroes. Batman, a flawed anti-hero. Achilles, a flawed demigod. The link is there between them. You can find a link between uh, the god Apollo and Superman. In fact, you can find a link between Ant-Man and Zeus. It's a bit more tenuous, but there is a Greek mythological story about Zeus disguising himself as an ant, coming down from Mount Olympus to the uh, human world, 
purely and simply so that he could have sex with lots of beautiful women. The point being, you can find these links, you can find the messages, and you can reinterpret them however it is you wish to suit the purpose of what you're trying to tell. Medea. Medea became the poster girl for the modern feminist movement based purely on her story. And actually, I love this example. The 300, the 300 Spartans. That's, that's a real story rooted in history, but the film is based upon the graphic novel. And that story gave rise to a modern fitness movement that saw profits rise in every gym around the world as every man took a look in the mirror and took himself off to the gym. There was never a better time to become a personal trainer than after that particular film came out. But these stories, they still have such strong messaging and such connotations behind them that even commercially, they sell. Consider some of your more popular brands, Nike, Hermes, or places like Amazon or Starbucks. They draw from Greek mythological stories. Their names are taken from Greek mythological characters because of the connotations behind their origin stories. Therefore, frankly, and when I was studying this subject, people often said, well, why are you studying classics? It's a dead subject. That's a little harsh, because if you consider everything that we're talking about here, how could you possibly label these as dead subjects when Greek mythology, both thematically and through imagination, continues to offer us so much? I had a very, um, very inspirational lecturer at university who taught us about the Odyssey. And when he was teaching it, he said that the Odyssey has the second widest readership in Western literature, second only to the Bible. Now, I'm not comparing it to the Bible, he said, but like the Bible, it is reread by successive generations. And every time people find new meaning in it based upon the things happening in their own lives. He reckoned that 40 years on, he was still learning as much from the Odyssey as he was when he first read it, because every year, students bring something new to the table. And how powerful is that? The ancient Greeks in their own time did arguably the same thing. They knew the stories. As we said before, they only had so many stories that they could tell. Going to the theater was basically just a reinvention of the same thing year on year. But they knew how to tell a story. Another person who knew how to tell a story was Alfred Hitchcock, and he said that people often su uh, confuse surprise and suspense. Surprise is that which is unexpected, and suspense is the process by which it is revealed. And the Greeks, when they wrote their stories, allowed for that framework to change and allowed for that framework to update these stories year on year. Mid-20th century, a chap called Joseph Campbell wrote um, this, which is the hero's journey chart. He'd managed to identify throughout every mythological story in Greek times, throughout history, through to the modern day, that there is a journey, a stereotypical journey that the archetypal hero goes on. George Lucas, when he wrote Star Wars, actually footnoted this particular hero's journey chart as his reasoning behind writing the story. When the droids arrive to give Luke his journey all the way through to the destruction of the Death Star. If we can find that structure through every story today, how can these stories be ever considered to still be ancient? To reinvent is to survive. More recently in America, uh, there's a theater director called David Stuttar, and he's just finished writing a book on the decline of Athens. And more pertinently, within that book, he talks about a young politician called Alcibiades. Now, Alcibiades was brash, he was narcissistic, he uh, abused his wealth and his power, he used rhetoric in order to undermine his opponents, he made alliances with people he shouldn't have made alliances with, and he was obsessed with his own image. Now, if you haven't drawn the parallel yourself, <laughs> David Stuttar did it for you, and he referred to Alcibiades as the Donald Trump of the ancient world. That's one commentator's view based upon a story that he's read and researched and brought it in conjunction with a modern parallel. Why? In order to be able to give the point that he wanted to make and make it relevant to the modern audience. Arguably, it becomes more obvious 
whence you can actually relate to something in your own lives. To reinvent, therefore, is to survive. And if you can identify the framework, you can isolate it, and you can identify the core message that you're looking to tell, like Campbell, like Stuttar, then arguably you can take any Greek mythological story still and make it relevant to a modern audience. Just before I wrap up, let me give you a quick example. I want to talk to you about Brexit. I don't. I don't want to talk to you about Brexit because I'm not here to give a political uh, view and, and you probably wouldn't be interested in it anyway. But if I were to take you back to the original part of the Brexit uh, myth, when you take you back to the start, Brexit was a time of hope. It was a time of what th could this be? What, what, are we, what are we possibly expecting out of it? And I now identify my core message that I'm trying to tell you through my story, which is be careful what you wish for. Well, the myth that neatly does that for you is Pandora's box. The Pandora's box myth that, that was there to tell man about the temptation of evil in this world. Pandora's box contained all the evil and all the negative in this world and was put in front of man. Did you want to open it? Did you not want to open it? What's inside it? You don't know, but if you don't open it, what was it? Might there have been something good? Might there not have been something good? The myth that we are now looking at in order to tell this story of Brexit is Pandora's box. You can find these links wherever it is that you look for them. What's so ancient about Greek mythology? Nothing apart from its age, but nothing. These mythological stories still give us so much to work with. They allow us a checkpoint of self-reflection uh, for us to be able to realign our own moral compass and to react accordingly if that is indeed required. It's not a 21st century question that we're asking here, not at all. And it will still be a question that we're asking ourselves in 100 years' time because ancient Greek mythology, whether you realize it or not, is so interwoven into our modern narrative. So, I mean, that's a lot of talking, but ultimately, if you take one thing away from it, it would be to reinvent is to survive, and we should be doing that. Because there is no such thing as an original story, but that's okay. Why would we need to tell an original story when the ancient Greek mythological stories still offer us so much? What we need to be doing is updating them in order to help us in our own lives. And if anyone's interested, I still want to be Indiana Jones. <laughs> Thank you.